Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing good today. Hey, today we're going to be doing a little report on net neutrality and what they're doing to the internet. And stay with me now, because you're going to—if you use the internet, you do anything on the internet, you're going to want to see this. Uh, in Congress, House Representatives, they're voting in to have the FCC start controlling the internet, and it's going to be. It's going to be some good stuff and a lot of bad stuff. So they're talking about freedom of speech. They're talking about copyright stuff. They're talking about Internet providers being able to block content. They're talking about throttling speeds. So let's just go to the video. Let's go to the video and see it. And I'm going to sit here and watch it with you. So let's see what they say. Um, you are again opening the door uh, to vast new regulation of speech and content, I believe, and uh, our attorneys believe, um, it by, by giving the FCC this authority. And, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a First Amendment guy, I have a degree in journalism, I believe in free speech, and, and sometimes I don't like that speech. <laughs> sometimes I find it offensive. Um, the stuff that's illegal, you bet, we're all, we're all together on. But it, there, there's some interesting stories coming out around Europe and elsewhere where countries now, especially um, some of those in the more authoritarian part of the world, are using this argument now to crack down on political speech they find offensive. And, and, and so I think we have to be very careful as Republicans, Democrats, as all Americans, to try and find that balance between the obvious and, and, and the speech that, that really is, is about protecting the powerful. And, and I think we can find common ground on that, but I, I do wince a bit that um, we are opening the door, or, or you all are with your bill, um, to giving the FCC uh, the power to be uh, to tax the internet, the power to uh, uh, regulate speech on the internet uh, by going through a rulemaking. I, I think that, that heads us in a, in a little more dangerous direction. And meanwhile, it does not address some of the issues I hear in town halls, and I've done 20 of them every county in my district this year. Um, and really when people begin to step up and have issues, it's not the ISPs they're complaining about other than speeds and connectivity, that sort of thing. It is what's happening on, on some of the social media platforms um, which are not addressed by this bill. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I support the gentleman's amendment and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. You, the hard-working taxpayer, and the Democrats are happy to continue to run up the tab and never bring a budget to the floor to show you your values. Mr. Speaker, the American public deserves better. Today, the Democrats are leaving for their member retreat and then a two-week spring break. Let's hope they come back with more than a tan. Let's hope they come back with a new game plan. Let's hope they come back ready to work for the common good, not simply to appease their extremist radical base. Now, we are ready and eager to work with Democrats. We are ready to work with Democrats to secure our border. We are ready to work with Democrats to upgrade our infrastructure. We are ready to work with Democrats to lower the cost of prescription drugs and address the opioid crisis. We stand ready to work with anyone to solve problems our country faces in the next 100 days and beyond. After 100 days, please, Mr. Speaker, let's get to work. The American people deserve nothing less. I yield back. All time has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Um, the gentleman has no time remaining. Again, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number nine printed in part A of House Report 116-37. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. 
The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number nine, printed in part A of House Report number 116-37, offered by Mr. Trone of Maryland. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Trone, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. In the 21st century America, having reliable, high-speed internet broadband isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. Just like running water or electricity, it's part of our essential infrastructure. Yet millions of Americans in rural communities, including some in my district in Western Maryland, remain disconnected from the internet. That lack of connectivity leads to homework gaps, healthcare gaps, and economic development gaps. It's our job in Congress to eliminate those gaps. The Federal Communications Commission is required to report accurate data to the public so that we can make effective decisions about rural broadband infrastructure policy and investment. But there is strong evidence that the percentage of Americans without broadband access is much higher than the FCC's numbers indicate. In order to justify Chairman Pai's deregulation agenda, the FCC released highly flawed and misleading data that paints a false picture of broadband deployment in rural America. We now know the FCC's data was based on a massive error that was brought to his attention before the FCC disseminated the press release touting their success. That kind of deception could lead to millions of our neighbors in rural America being locked out of this critical good. This amendment seeks to address this issue by one, prohibiting the FCC from releasing a report based on information it knows to be inaccurate, and two, specifying the commission must use its best efforts to ensure all future reports are accurate and they must correct past inaccuracies prior to the release of new data on broadband deployment. It's pretty simple. We need accurate information to make the best decisions regarding broadband deployment. Let's ensure we get that from the FCC moving forward, and then let's ensure every American has access to reliable high-speed broadband. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. I reserve the balance of my time. For what gentleman reserves, for what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and I claim the time in opposition to the amendment, but I am not opposed to the amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate my colleagues' concern about the accuracy of the FCC's reports on deployment. I share those, uh, and with his broader concern about encouraging deployment generally. I agree with that. In fact, many members on both sides of the aisle share these concerns, especially when it comes to the unserved Americans in our most rural areas, like my district, that would stretch from the Atlantic to Ohio. It's a big district. So I will support your amendment. However, I would ask my colleagues to seriously consider, Mr. Chairman, the negative impacts of giving the FCC power to regulate rates on rural broadband deployment. Now, Mr. Kinzinger's amendment uh, to block any sort of rate regulation was actually blocked by the majority from being considered today, and that's unfortunate. At the full committee markup, Mr. Kinzinger highlighted a memo from the Congressional Research Service that noted there's nothing permanent to the forbearance that the majority claims to be doing when it comes to controlling the prices providers charge consumers. So we could get into rate regulation through the FCC and every ISP would have to come back here and beg and, and explain their rate structure and everything else. And uh, we got thousands of them. The majority attempted to remedy this flaw with some additional language pouring to lock in the FCC's forbearance on this matter, but the actual effect of that language is still unclear. And most importantly, they left open the broad authority of Sections 201 and 202 of the Communications Act and other authority that gives the Federal Communications Commission, all five unelected officials, plenty of leeway to regulate rates under Title II. Now, the legislation we have before us clearly leaves the door open to rate regulation. If this were not the case, then the Kinzinger Amendment, I would think, would be before the House today or have been approved in committee when we had a chance to do that. This is no way to conduct business in the Internet age. These Title II regulations were originally implemented for railroads and monopolies in the 19th century. 
So if you really believe in a competitive open marketplace and a competitive open internet, you don't turn it over to unelected bureaucrats in Washington to micromanage. As they, uh, as they were applied in their original incarnation, the requirements of just and reasonable practices under Section 201B and no unreasonable discrimination or 202A, which by the way sound perfect, provided sufficient authority to impose price controls on railroads. So by opening the door with Title II and these other sections of law, you're now giving this vast power uh, to basically three unelected officials at the FCC. You just need a majority to decide uh, how the whole Internet runs. And so I think that's a problem. I support the amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Chairman, good policy simply needs good data. We need accurate, reliable information to target our policies and resources as effectively as possible. This amendment simply ensures reports issued by the FCC are accurate. And we should all be able to agree on that, and thank you for that. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman Mr. Chairman, Oregon's I have right no other speakers. Um, I don't know if, if you all do on your side. I'll reserve. Mr. Doyle. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Save the Internet Act is going to ensure net neutrality and, and help bring the Internet to parts of the country that don't yet have it. And I, and I would say to my friend from Oregon, the bill is crystal clear on, on rate regulation. Uh, the language clearly prohibits any rate, rate regulation, so uh, rural folks need not worry about that. Uh, through the Act, the FCC will have the authority to accelerate deployment of broadband by removing barriers to infrastructure investment and by promoting competition. Uh, and furthering that goal, Congress requires that the FCC report on the state of broadband deployment nationwide. The results every year are particularly important because they're used to figure out where to best direct funds for rural broadband deployment. And to name a few, that's important for consumers, schools, libraries, hospitals, that they get the connections they need. And we need to know that the FCC's data, the FCC's data is accurate. We expect the FCC to use its best efforts to ensure that the data is up to date and error free before releasing their reports. Uh, recently, the traditional diligence of the FCC has been called into question. According to news reports, the FCC is preparing a report that contains data that an Internet service provider has told the FCC is wrong. Uh, the carrier reported that it provided high-speed broadband to everyone in 10 states when its actual service area was a fraction of that. This serious oversight seriously alters the state of broadband deployment in this country and calls into question data used by this administration to justify other policies. Despite that Internet service provider coming forward, the FCC has not even corrected a press statement that was in part based on that erroneous data entitled America's Digital Divided Narrows Substantially. As the expert agency regulating broadband, it cannot knowingly put out false information that misleads the public. This amendment will help remedy that, and that's why I support it, and that's why I think we should all vote for it, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. A gentleman from Oregon. Mr. Chairman, may I inquire how much time remains on my side? Uh, the gentleman from Oregon has two and a half minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I will yield my t myself such time as I may consume. Again, I appreciate uh, the gentleman's amendment. As I say, I intend to support it. Um, we need the facts here, and I support getting the facts. We know the reporting data we get often is not accurate, and if people are lying about their data, then we should hold them accountable, and I'll join you in that effort. Um, that's not uh, acceptable. But on the, issue of on the issue of rate regulation, that's what Title II is all about. That's what this bill gives the FCC the authority to do. And while you can argue... <coughs> that by adopting the forbearances that the FCC uh, did under Title II when they had that authority uh, may preclude rate regulation there. By giving them this enormous authority, your own counsel testified in answer to our question that they could go through a standard rulemaking process and use Section 201 and 202 to do their own rate regulation. You see, you may close the front door, but you left the back door open. Actually, you created a back door. And that's where I'm concerned, and my side is concerned, that you're empowering the FCC with these incredible authorities designed for monopoly railroads and designed for monopoly communication systems that could really hamper future investment in things like 5G and, and provide all this micromanagement of the Internet and harm consumers. And that's why 
So many of us oppose this, per, this particular provision. I think you've seen Republicans on this floor, Mr. Chairman, accept the Democrats' amendments in almost every case. They block some of ours from being able to be considered. But when it comes to this fundamental issue of turning the Internet over to the federal government and three unelected people to do incredible things um, that aren't good, long-term benefit of consumers and new technologies, we have to remain opposed. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Now, in order to consider amendment number 10, printed in part A of House Report 116-37, for what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 10, printed in Part A of House Report number 116-37, offered by Mr. Brindisi of New York. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Brindisi, is in a member opposed. Each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York. Mr. Chair, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chair, I would like to thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for his leadership on this important topic. The free market is the cornerstone of America's economy, and this bill would ensure that free market competition is protected on the Internet. However, for many Americans living in small towns, basic Internet access remains out of reach. Too many homes in rural areas are not connected at all to high-speed broadband, and those that are online suffer from slow speeds and constant interruptions in service. Customers see their bills go up month after month, and service just gets worse and worse. Internet access is essential in today's economy, and we need to do more to connect rural areas to high-speed broadband. My amendment would direct the Government Accountability Office to issue recommendations on how to expand broadband Internet service in rural and other underserved areas. This information will help guide our work on how to best expand broadband access in rural communities. I urge adoption of my amendment, and I again thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for his leadership on this bill and urge our colleagues to pass the underlying legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I claim the time in opposition to the amendment, although I'm not opposed uh, to the amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I support this amendment to require the GAO to look into ways to promote and deployment of broadband to our most rural and underserved areas. It's a very worthy subject and one I think we can find some really broad bipartisan agreement. It is a top priority of mine and has been, so I won't oppose the amendment. We're obviously delegating a lot of authority to the GAO, which is a wonderful organization, but we all have had hearings and know what really needs to happen, I think, going forward to get broadband built out. However, if you're really concerned about deployment to rural and underserved areas, you should be extremely concerned about the impact the underlying bill is going to have on our ability to get broadband out to these areas and close the digital divide. Title II is a proven investment killer, period, hard stop. This is shown not only in the overall nationwide investment numbers going down during the only two-year blip these rules were in effect. Remember, my colleague from New York, these Internet rules you're about um, only existed for less than about two years. That's it. The whole growth, the expansion of the Internet and broadband occurred during the period of the 1990s to 2015. And then uh, the Internet order was put in, investment went down, and uh, then the Internet order was, was repealed, investments going up. Um, the, the head of the Eastern Oregon Telecom uh, Company, Joe Fresnel, came back to Washington and testified uh, before our subcommittee uh, and, and said, look, under Title II, his investors lost interest. Deals dried up. The bank wouldn't even give him a loan. It was an extremely compelling story from somebody that's on the front lines of getting broadband built out to the very areas you and I would agree need service. And we heard from many other small rural ISPs as well under the same stories. They're the ones who take the worst hit under Title II that's in this bill you support. Now, I submitted an amendment to the Rules Committee to do something real to address the worst uncertainties that these small carriers have to deal with under Title II. Title II opens the door to government control of private networks. It opens the door to government taxation of the Internet. It opens the door to government regulation of speech online, and my amendment would have closed all of those doors. 
Unfortunately, the Democrats, again, who control the Rules Committee, Mr. Chairman, two to one, would not find a way to even allow us to bring that amendment here for a vote or a debate. I have to say, under Title II, our smallest rural ISPs would have a really tough time, and we have seen a lot of evidence to this in the past. So I hope my friends will consider that when we're voting on this underlying bill, we're actually going to cause those small ISPs more harm than good, and that will delay deployment into unserved and underserved communities. The GAO study on deployment will have no impact whatsoever on deployment killing excess as the Title II, uh, but it will give us some ideas about how to build out broadband, so I won't oppose the amendment. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I thank the gentleman from Oregon. I want to yield time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. You, you know, we keep hearing this talk about how investment uh, plummeted uh, after the 2015 order. Well, that, we all know that's, that's not true, and the proof is in the pudding. Investment data shows an aggregate increase in investment following the FCC's February 2015 vote to adopt the open Internet rules compared to the two years following the repeal of the 2015 order when investment actually decreased. The same was true of most ISPs' individual investments. The majority of publicly traded broadband providers reported investment increases after the 2015 order was adopted. And in the first year following adoption of the 2015 uh, rules, census data showed a $3.5 billion jump in capital spending in data processing, hosting, and related services. Moreover, the repeal of the 2015 order did not result in a used boost to infrastructure spending as the Trump FCC asserted it would happen. Instead, investment actually decreased. This amendment before us is important. Uh, though many of our constituents enjoy easy access to high-speed broadband, there are still many pockets of this country that aren't served by high-speed broadband. Or as my good friend Peter Welch from the great state of Vermont says about the promises of 5G, some of us have no Gs. The Save the Internet Act is going to restore net neutrality through the country, and it's going to give the FCC key authorities that buttress critical programs such as Connect America Fund that provides money to build high-speed broadband out to areas where it would not be economic to do so without the funding. The Save the Internet Act also gives Internet service providers non-discriminatory access to rights of ways and polls which will facilitate build out in rural areas. You know, unless we connect our rural communities, the people in them cannot fully be active participants in the 21st century economy. They're missing out on an education and workforce opportunities that are so often now delivered online. That's why the, much of the rural broadband deployment in this country is funded by the Connect America Fund. This amendment would require GAO to examine these issues and to provide a report with recommendations about how the government can promote build-out to hard-to-reach or otherwise to overlook communities. This is such an important policy issue and such an important part of saving the Internet. I look forward to joining my colleagues in supporting this amendment. I yield back. Does the gentleman from New York reserve? Yes, Mr. Chair, I ur again urge adoption of the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Can I inquire as to how much time remains, Mr. Chairman? The gentleman has two and one quarter minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate my, both my colleagues' comments. Look, the nationwide numbers of investment obscure what happens in our smallest uh, in investors um, among those that are out there like Joe Fresnel in Eastern Oregon trying to build out what we do know is he came back and testified to the problem he encountered individually as one who is very progressive and active trying to connect really difficult places to get to with highest speed broadband possible and I've met with him before I've met with him during I met with him afterwards he came back on his own dime to make the case that when these rules were in effect he had difficulty getting loans he had difficulty building out he was burdened more than he'd ever been burdened before, and that diminished his ability to build out. His numbers probably are, are, a, are, are dust in terms of investment that, that the big companies have, but that's who I care about are the little operators um, that are so pushed down by this heavy hand of government overregulation. And so that's, I think, what we have to maintain our focus on. And again, um, Title II gives these vast, unprecedented powers to the FCC to regulate the Internet like it's never been regulated before. People who have no Gs need our help. 
but people who are waiting for 5G don't need us to pass legislation that will screw it up and diminish innovation. And that's what um, I'm uh, one of the reasons I'm opposing this version of, of net neutrality. We could agree on no throttling and no blocking and a paid prioritization issue as well. The other thing I found interesting, Mr. Chairman, is throughout the course of all of our hearings, um, there wasn't a, a witness panel of people who had faced all these parade of horribles we've heard about from ISPs. There, there weren't any witnesses. They couldn't, they didn't bring anybody. I don't know if they're out there or not. They didn't bring anybody that's been affected by the, by the edge providers, however, and that's another subject for our conversation going forward. So with that, I support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number 11, printed in part A of House Report 116-37. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Virginia seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. House Report number 116-37, offered by Ms. Spanberger of Virginia. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Spanberger, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of my common sense broadband mapping amendment to H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act of 2019. The digital gap between our rural and urban communities is real, and I hear it about it from the people I serve every day. According to the FCC's 2018 broadband deployment report, more than 30% of rural Americans lack access to high-speed fixed broadband, compared to only 2% of urban Americans. This disparity has long-term implications for the economic strength and security of our country. In rural America, a lack of reliable broadband internet makes it harder for businesses to find customers and attract new employees. Without reliable broadband internet, communities across this country face challenges attracting new businesses and investment. In rural America, farmers have a tougher time using the latest precision agriculture technology, and in places without reliable broadband internet, kids find it difficult to complete their homework assignments. In our district, in central Virginia, farmers and producers are disadvantaged because the lack of broadband makes doing business harder. In our district, constituents drive their kids to McDonald's or to neighboring counties so that they can complete their research projects for school. And what's happening in our district is happening nationwide. Today we are considering a critical, a critical piece of legislation to champion the idea of a free and open internet. There's no question that rural broadband internet access should be a part of this conversation, as this bill would also include a provision to restore the FCC's authority to fund the expansion of broadband access across our rural communities. But right now, there are many questions surrounding the accuracy of the FCC's broadband internet maps, which detail which areas in the United States have high-speed internet coverage and which do not. These maps have important implications for our rural communities, schools, and businesses. These maps are used to award funding and subsidies to expand broadband coverage to areas that don't have it. And in many cases, these efforts have led to great success. However, these maps have been found to be inaccurate, incomplete, or unreliable. Often, a map will claim an entire area is covered by high-speed broadband, when in reality, only a small portion of that area has reliable coverage. This trend should not be the status quo in our digital age because it leaves so many rural families underserved. Areas where the FCC's maps incorrectly say there is high-speed rural broadband connectivity are often ineligible for funding to expand broadband, and these inaccuracies greatly disadvantage our rural communities. Erroneous information in these maps could be the difference between a senior citizen being able to access life-saving telemedicine services or not. It could be the difference between a farmer who can keep up with market fluctuations halfway across the world or not. And it could control the ability of a young aspiring student to access online information, college applications, and research materials. My amendment to the Save the Internet Act would address a lack of reliable broadband internet connectivity in our rural communities, and it would begin to fix the errors in our current broadband maps. 
My amendment would require the Government Accountability Office to produce a full report that examines the accuracy and quality of the FCC's broadband mapping. This report would also identify what the FCC should do to produce more accurate, reliable, and high-quality maps. Additionally, the GAO report required by my amendment would help identify the scope of the broadband mapping problem and actually suggest solutions. With this new information, the FCC would be better able to update its maps so that we can properly target our broadband expansion efforts to the rural towns, townships, communities across our district. Better maps of broadband coverage are a critical first step towards getting high-speed internet to every household, something we should aim to do in our globalized, digitally focused economy. And we're having important discussions about protecting and expanding reliable access to the internet, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to H.R. 1644. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek well, recognition? Mr. Chairman, I uh, claim the time in opposition to the amendment, although I don't think I'm opposed to the amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five so minutes. I, I don't disagree with my colleague from Virginia that the map showing broadband deployment in the United States can and must be improved. Um, that's why when Republicans held the majority for the energy and commerce, we held numerous hearings on how to, how to do that, how to improve broadband mapping at the FCC. We also shared legislation with our Democratic then minority colleagues to bring in the expertise of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration to aggregate granular data beyond the carrier data that the FCC uses for its maps. Unfortunately, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, didn't want to work with us to improve mapping last Congress. I'm more hopeful this time. Um, that we can engage, we're ready, willing, and able to do so, and that we could address this matter. Mapping is clearly important. I think we all agree on that, and it's where we should focus our limited federal money on broadband support. But rather than help spur broadband deployment and provide more granular data, the underlying legislation would make it more difficult on broadband providers to deploy broadband. We just discussed how investment in broadband, especially for our small providers, suffered under Title II. They came and testified to that. But my reservation on this amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, has to do with the conflict that I see between the Wexler Amendment Number 5 and the Spamberger Amendment Number 11. I wonder if the gentlelady from Virginia would care to comment about that, and I'd be happy to yield. And I didn't have a chance to, to, to talk with it. It may not be fair. I'll, I'll, I'll reclaim. The, the, the issue here is the Wexler Amendment, which we did not oppose, requires the Federal Communications Commission to submit to Congress within 30 days a plan for how the Commission will evaluate and address problems with the collection of Form 477 data. I believe those are the same data we're talking about with your amendment to have the GAO do this investigation and report to Congress as well. The conflict I see is, on the one hand, we're telling the FCC, go do your work and report back in 30 days. But on your amendment, we're telling the GAO, go do your work and tell us eventually where the problems are, and they can do that. But we've already told the FCC to report back their answers. And that I'm not going to oppose your amendment, but it just seems like there's kind of a conflict here, potentially, because we want to get it right. And it seems like we would wait to have the FCC report back until the GAO had completed its work. And then we could work with the FCC to say, OK, now that we know what the GAO has found and informed us on, then FCC go report back. So I might have structured this uh, a little differently had, had we, uh, we kind of had time to, to work out some of that. I'm not going to oppose the General Lee's amendment. We got to get the data right. We have to get the mapping right. When the uh, uh, stimulus came out in the Obama administration, I argued this very point in the committee. We were in the minority then, and so of course I lost. But they were spending the money that was being set aside in the stimulus to build out broadband in America before they had the maps to figure out where people were underserved and unserved. And it seemed kind of backwards then, and I think it was. We didn't get the maps till after the money was allocated. And then the time to do the audits and evaluations of how that money was spent, the money for that ran out before the build-out was finished. So we had to come back and look at that, and then we did find limited cases of some fraud and abuse, not much frankly, but enough. It's taxpayer dollars. So I won't oppose the, the General A's amendment. I think we're, we're, you know, we can work these things out if this bill were to move forward. But the timing is the issue that I, I have some reservation on. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Uh, the gentlewoman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, how much time do I have remaining? The gentlewoman has one minute remaining. I yield the balance of my time to Congressman Doyle. 
Uh, I thank the, the, the gentleman lady. from Pennsylvania is recognized. And I would just say to my, my friend, I think what we're trying to do in these two amendments, we, we need uh, we need the FCC to get on this as soon as possible, but we need the GAO to continue to, to, to look at this. But uh, I, I understand what the gentleman's saying. Um, look, we, we know these maps are wrong. I, I mean, nobody's arguing about that, and it, it's unacceptable. And, and what the general lady's amendment would do is ask the GAO to do a report to examine the current mapping processes for both wireless and, and wireline services. Uh, they'd also be asked to identify what FCC programs and actions uh, rely on maps and to make recommendations on how the FCC could produce more reliable maps. I think this is an important amendment. Uh, I support it, and I would urge all my colleagues to support it also. I yield back. Gentlemen's, general, gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman I, from Oregon. You know, I yield myself such time as I may consume. I appreciate the uh, uh, gentlelady's amendment and the gentleman's comments. Um, we can figure out how to work this out, I think. <clears throat> but clearly, we got to fix the maps. And even the industry has told me, at least, they, they admit the data, the way it's collected and everything else is not an accurate representation. They'd like our help in this as well. And hopefully, we can move forward on an NTIA reauthorization as well. Uh, we, we marched through a number of agency uh, reauthorizations and programmatic reauthorizations. Hadn't been done in decades in the last two years. And we should continue that important work as well. We stand ready as Republicans to, uh, to join our colleagues to get that done. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The question uh, is now on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Virginia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number 12, printed in part A of House Report 116-37. For what purpose does the gentleman from Utah seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 12, printed in Part A of House Report number 116-37, offered by Mr. McAdams of Utah. Pursuant to House Resolution 294, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. McAdams, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise today in, to offer an amendment to H.R. 1644, the Save the Internet Act. As the father of four children, I worry about what my kids see on social media and online. And I know firsthand how important it is that illegal content doesn't pollute the internet. My amendment would affirm that this bill preserves broadband internet service providers' ability to block unlawful content, including disturbing and harmful materials like child pornography. We're here today to vote on legislation pr to protect the internet as an engine of innovation and open communication, free from undue restrictions such as blocking legal content and services, throttling service, and paid prioritization of content. While the bill does not, as currently written, revoke service providers' ability to block illegal content, I believe the House can agree that we should nonetheless affirm our commitment to stopping unlawful behaviors such as viewing child pornography and copyright infringement. My amendment does not impose additional or onerous legal requirements on service providers to act as an arbiter of lawlessness, lawfulness, but rather ensures providers can continue working with consumer watchdogs and law enforcement to keep our internet free from illegal content and to make it safe for our families. Let me reiterate, this amendment also does not grant ISPs any new rights to block content that is lawful or decide what is lawful on the internet. My amendment simply stands for the proposition that unlawful content is not protected by net neutrality rules. It's, on, it's one thing to say ISPs can block content subject to a valid court order, and quite another to let ISPs make decisions about the lawf lawfulness of content for themselves. This amendment strikes that balance. We have bipartisan consensus on the tremendous value of the Internet's contribution to our society's innovation and communication, and I also know that there is bipartisan concern about severe illegal misuses of the Internet's power. I believe my amendment offers us an opportunity to once again confirm our support for a free internet with unfettered access to legal content and our vehement opposition to child pornography. I thank the members of the committee for their work on this legislation and I urge a yes vote on my amendment and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen reserves, for what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I rise to uh, claim time in opposition to the amendment, although I'm not opposed to this amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for and five I, minutes. I agree, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with my colleague across the aisle, uh, Mr. McAdams, that ISPs should be able to block unlawful content, and I support your amendment. Uh, 
In fact, even when the FCC imposed the heavy-handed Title II regulations, it recognized in paragraph 113 of its order that the ban on blocking did not, and I quote, prevent or restrict a broadband provider from refusing to transmit unlawful material such as child pornography or copyright infringing materials, close quote. This was similar to the FCC's earlier non-blocking rule that was also affirmed uh, that ISPs could block material that was unlawful. It, it strikes me as interesting that you have to have this amendment to apparently clarify an ambiguity some must feel exists in the underlying bill, but we'll support it if that's necessary to do that. I firmly support net neutrality. It allows Americans to enjoy the lawful content on the Internet and applications of their choosing. I would point out to my friend from Utah that uh, it, the concerns about social media, and I share them, um, uh, are not covered by this legislation. Um, those big platforms are completely exempt, as near as we can tell. Um, and so that's another area where I think we all share a, a common bond that there's concern about what goes on on social media, things that aren't uh, legal things that are fake, things that, I mean, you name it. But under Title II, the FCC could police Internet content as it currently does with content broadcast over television or radio. Now, I was a radio broadcaster for 21 years, owned and operated stations, um, and that concerns me a bit if we're going to get the FCC being the, the nation's speech police. Uh, by making further rules on the ISPs, you, you might be able to end up there. That's a concern. This is really broad, open-ended authority that um, you all are giving to the Federal Communications Commission. That's because the FCC did not forbear from some content-specific provisions of Title II. Um, such as Section 223. That would give the FCC authority to impose content-based restrictions if it found it to be, quote-unquote, just and reasonable. So that goes well beyond just the legal content, I think. I'm not burdened with a law degree, but I have some really good lawyers that counsel me on these matters. This is why we offered an amendment that would have put certain protections in place for consumers' freedom of speech online, because that's also something we all swear to uphold is our First Amendment rights of religion and speech. But rather than, than talk about how we can prevent the FCC from someday abusing the expansive authority that the majority is about to give it, um, we're here discussing something that's been universally agreed upon by all parties to this debate. So we appreciate your perfecting amendment to this legislation. I intend to support it, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How much time do I have remaining? The gentleman has three minutes remaining. Thank you. You yield to me. Yeah, I'll yield uh, to uh, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Uh, could I ask the gentleman if he would yield for the purpose of a colloquy? Yes, I yield to Chairman Doyle. Congressman, my understanding of your amendment is that it simply restates what is already in the 2015 Open Internet Order, namely that nothing in this bill would prohibit ISPs from blocking an unlawful content uh, and nothing in this act adds any additional requirement or right for an ISP to decide what is lawful content. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that is correct. Nothing in this amendment grants any sort of new rights to an ISP. Rather, this amendment simply stands for the proposition that unlawful content is not protected by net neutrality rules. In other words, blocking unlawful content does not violate net neutrality. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman for clarifying that. I support the gentleman's amendment. Uh, since this is the uh, last of the amendments to be offered, uh, I just wanted to take this time to uh, thank my friend uh, and, and the Republican side for a vigorous debate, uh, not only uh, in our committee but here on the floor. And I would also be remiss if I didn't thank our staffs, uh, namely Alex Hohenserich, Jerry Leverich, Jennifer Epperson, A.J. Brown, Dan Miller, Kenneth DeGraff, and, uh, and my telecom staff, uh, Philip Murphy, who uh, without him, uh, I wouldn't sound as intelligent as I do on these matters. But I, I want to thank uh, all of the Democratic staff. They work very hard, and, and uh, they deserve our thanks. Uh, this has been a, a vigorous debate, as it should be, uh, but we're coming to a close now, and uh, I thank my friend for uh, his participation. Uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll uh, yield myself such time as I may consume. And I want to thank again the gentleman from Utah for bringing us this amendment. 
So my, I, I guess my suspicions were right. It's merely restating what's already in the 2015 order, which is what this bill basically reinstates into law. And I, I, uh, I want to thank my staff as well, the great job they've done, um, and, and appreciate uh, both sides as we work together on these complicated and sometimes controversial issues. Um, I, I just would point out that under Section 223 and 201, um, you are again opening the door uh, to vast new regulation of speech and content, I believe, and uh, our attorneys believe, um, it by, by giving the FCC this authority. And, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a First Amendment guy, I have a degree in journalism, I believe in free speech, and, and sometimes I don't like that speech. <laughs> sometimes I find it offensive. Um, the stuff that's illegal, you bet, we're all, we're all together on. But it, there, there's some interesting stories coming out around Europe and elsewhere where countries now, especially um, some of those in the more authoritarian part of the world, are using this argument now to crack down on political speech they find offensive. And, and, and so I think we have to be very careful as Republicans, Democrats, as all Americans, to try and find that balance between the obvious and, and, and the speech that, that really is, is about protecting the powerful. And, and I think we can find common ground on that, but I, I do wince a bit that um, we are opening the door, or, or you all are with your bill, um, to giving the FCC uh, the power to, be, uh, to tax the Internet, the power to uh, uh, regulate speech on the Internet uh, by going through a rulemaking. I, I think that, that heads us in a, in a little more dangerous direction. And meanwhile, it does not address some of the issues I hear in town halls, and I've done 20 of them every county in my district this year. Um, and really when people begin to step up and have issues, it's not the ISPs they're complaining about other than speeds and connectivity, that sort of thing. It is what's happening on, on some of the social media platforms um, which are not addressed by this bill. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I support the gentleman's amendment and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, I yield back. All right, gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, I request a recorded vote. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. So the there you have it. That's what's going on with your internet and your internet providers. You got to be real careful on the internet, what you watch, what you say. And when you're buying stuff, paying taxes on stuff, I mean, it's just the responsibility is going to be crushing if this goes all the way to the end. So this is Harold with WorldTVOnDemand.com. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll have another video for you soon. And you guys have a fantastic day and happy surfing on the Internet while we still have it. Ha, 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 ha.